In his, in Aesop's fable, the bull and the, or three bulls and the lion, he tells a version of the following story. There once lived three bulls who had pastured together for a long time. They had an abundance of food. They had good companionship, water. Life was easy. But nearby, there lived a lion. And he longed day and night to feast on one of those succulent bulls. But when they were together, he was too afraid to attack, too afraid to come after them because they could defend one another. But this lion was crafty. He had his own ways. And so he began to draw near and he would whisper into the ears of the bulls. You know, you'd be better off. You'd have more food if you were on your own, if you had gone away from these other two. Perhaps would come the inevitable, inevitable reply of the bulls, but I have all I need right here. There's no reason to go wandering off. Life is good. And so the lion, frustrated, would sulk off, hungry, but too afraid to attack. But as times changed, as they always do, as conditions changed, as they always do, resources became a little more scarce, and the bulls started to look a little gaunt. They began to speak with one another. They had conversations about what to do with the situation. And so the, the first bull would say, you know, we need to, to look for new pastures. We need to go off to Maybe over the horizon, there's, there's got to be something more. There's got to be something else out there. And, and the second bull would turn and say, no, no, no. We've been through times like this before. We just need to stay where we are. Things will turn around. Don't you worry. The third bull had his own ideas. He, he had some great insights. But the other two always dismissed him. And so he just stopped speaking altogether. Why bother if no one's going to listen to what you have to say Anyways, the crafty lion saw his opportunity. He began to whisper a little bit more fervently into the ears of each bull. To the first one, he said, these other two are just holding you back. You'd have the abundant green pastures you've been dreaming about for years. If, if you just left them behind, if you went out on your own, these two are just dragging you down. To the second bull, he turned and he would say, these other two young bulls, they, they just don't understand history or the past. They don't understand that, that there's richness in our tradition and what we've always done. To the third bull, he turned and said, you know, maybe it's time you took your talent elsewhere where it's finally fully appreciated and recognized. Maybe it's time you go out on your own. As the arguing between the bulls continued and conditions got worse, they began to yell back and forth at one another. The first bull yelling, if you just listen to me, we'd be with the other bulls that I've heard about over the horizon. Things would be good. Don't you know that, that I'm the leader? I'm the one in charge. We've been doing this for so long. You just need to step in line. We don't have to change who we are. We just, we need to rethink about how we're doing things. They yelled and they yelled, but none of them were listening to one another. They were too hungry, too frustrated, too scared, until finally their unity was broken. The bulls went off in their own direction. As you can imagine, the lion was overjoyed. His plan had finally worked. With each of them walking off in their own direction, he picked them off one after another, after another, feasting and feasting at his own leisure. See, if the bulls had stayed together, the lion would have been too afraid to attack, too afraid to go after this food. He would have continued to sulk off in the corner. But with them alone, they were easy to distract, easy to take down. The moral of Aesop's fable, union is strength. There's strength in standing together. Today, in today's epistle letter, Paul has become concerned about the church in Corinth because it's a church divided. Everyone is going their own direction. 
and they, they're starting to become weak and vulnerable. One says, I follow Paul. I follow Apollos. I follow Christ. I follow Cephas. Each one has their own agendas, their own ideas, their own way of doing things, and they've become a divided church. Now, we don't know the whole story of all of the circumstances that were going on in Corinth, but you can tell from Paul's letter that people had become arrogant about their own ideas, their own ways. They thought they were better spiritual people. And then when that happens in one group, another group has to defend their own position, and you begin to argue and bicker. And the divisions increase as circumstances change. So Paul hears all of this. And he appeals and he admonishes the people of Corinth to remember their foundation. To remember what drew them there in the first place. The gospel. And so he begins to ask them a series of questions. Were you, is Christ's body divided? No, there is one body of Christ. Were you baptized into the, the name of Paul? No, you were baptized into the name of Jesus. Has Paul died for your sins? No, there is only one Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Therefore, remember that you are one body under one Lord, baptized into one man's death and resurrection, one man's hope. One man's story is your hope. Therefore, be a united church, a unified church. Paul needs to remind the Corinthians that they were to be one body. They were to work together. And so often, we as a church, we, we forget that. We need to be reminded as well that, that we're to be one church working together. See, how does it happen that we forget all this? Well, it happens because we, we start to experience the the cultural reality is as things change. Suddenly the, the church doesn't look as glorious as it once did. We've lost our position at the center of culture. Society and media begin to marginalize our message. Suddenly people aren't flocking to church on Sunday mornings like they used to. Everything seems to have changed and it's, it's scary. We feel the loss of our position at the center of culture. We worry about the future of our church. We worry about whether or not our, our kids and our grandkids are going to know the hope we have in Christ. Whether or not they're going to have that foundation when things get difficult to stand on a church that, that comes together in difficult times. We're all concerned and, and we all want to do something about it. But we each have our own ideas. One group says it's time to imitate the mega church down the road. It's time to imitate the church in the city that's, that's having success. We need to be more like them. We need to change who we are. Another group chimes in that, that we've, we've always been a church about these traditions. We need more organ, more high church, more door-to-door -door evangelism, more invite a friend to, to church Sundays, whatever it might look like. But we have another group that's saying... We need to change how we're saying the message. We need to become relevant to the youth. We need to have the music that they like and, and be more attractional. Now, I'm not trying to make a judgment about any one of those answers. There's validity to each and every one. But the problem is that as we're yelling about these things, we're not listening to one another. We're not working together. Instead, we're divided because we're scared. We're scared because things have changed. We're concerned about tomorrow. We're, we're sure that maybe we have the idea that will fix the church because we read about it in some book or saw some other church doing the right thing or doing this program. And so we, we think that we have the answer and we stop listening and talking to one another. But as we're in a frenzy, worried about tomorrow, worried about what comes, obsessing over how we're going to save the church, our enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. He prowls around looking for the weak, for the concerned, for those who are arrogant, those who are obsessed about trying to figure out their answers, trying to do it their own way. And he begins to whisper into each and every one of our ears a little bit more fervently. Maybe it's time you went to another church. This, this church isn't listening. This church isn't doing the right thing. 
or, or better yet, maybe you're better off without the church altogether. The, the body is frustrating. People never listen. It's full of broken people and sinners. You know, you can listen to good sermons online and just read scripture on your own. You don't even need the church. He begins to whisper more and more fervently. You have the best ideas anyways. Why won't these people listen to you? He continues to distract us from the foundation that has kept us here, the gospel, from the heart of what drew us here in the first place, the good news of what Jesus has done. As we begin to obsess over how we're going to save the church, what idea or agenda we need to pursue, another person silently slips out the side door. Another person leaves at the back and doesn't return because we were too concerned about our ideas, about how we were going to fix things, that we lost sight of proclaiming the gospel message, of proclaiming the truth of why we're here, what Jesus has done. See, Paul admonishes us as the church to find unity in the faith, to be of, of one mind and one judgment. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't have different ideas or different opinions. It doesn't mean that we don't voice different ways of doing things. But it means that we need to talk to one another and that when the church has made a decision, that we all get behind it, that we all get behind that decision, that we all support it and push forward whatever comes. Why? Because it's really just about the gospel. And there are many different ways you can proclaim that truth. And so we need to come together as one church. See, this happens because we can let go of realizing that it's not our job to save the church. See, if Jesus is Lord of the church, and he is, then he will not abandon or forsake the church. He is still in control no matter what comes. But we need to be working together, looking where he's leading us, looking where he's calling us to go what he's calling us to do, what opportunities he's placing in front of us. See, Jesus is our hope moving forward. And so Paul appeals to the church in Corinth and to us today to find unity in Christ our Lord. That unity comes in faithfulness to Jesus and his gospel. See, there are many ways the church can do things. There are many different ways that we can go about uh, with new programs or new New services, new mentalities towards worship or towards evangelism, whatever it might be. But everything is grounded in the one truth that we are one people under one Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. After all, there is only one Savior, one church, one baptism, one gospel. That one gospel is that Jesus Christ alone is Lord and he is reigning over all creation. That we are all saved by his blood shed on the cross. That's our hope. That's our foundation. Everything else we do, everything we do, has to be about proclaiming that truth. Either the cross is everything or it is nothing at all. When we lose sight of our, our foundation to proclaim the gospel message of Christ crucified, our opinions, our ideas... Our agendas, our programs, our rich 165-year history, our feelings and our pride become too important. We start to lose sight of what really matters, and we get into this mentality that we must be right, as so we hold on too tightly to those things, and we start to make them into idols that will save us instead of trusting that Jesus is in control. See, the church has always been and continues to need to be about Christ crucified. Yes, it is folly to, to those who are lost, foolishness and weakness to those who are outside the church. But to those of us who are being saved, it is the power and the wisdom of God. See, while our church while the church as a whole may have lost its position as the power brokers of culture, while we may be being pushed to the margins of society, we may have lost some of our, our influence. The gospel itself has not lost its power to transform lives, has not lost its power to shine light into the darkness, has not lost its power to cast out and forgive sins. The gospel has not become weak. 
and we should not be ashamed of his message. That is who we are, and that is where we rest our foundation. So I appeal to you, hold fast in the unity of Christ as God's one people, in his unshakable promises. Amen.